Hey, I want to reiterate a few things that were already mentioned. Um, this will be our last Sunday morning of the year. So next Sunday, we'll be together in the evening at the Fox Theater. Awesome opportunity to invite family and friends. Next Sunday is New Year's Day, so we won't be worshiping here on New Year's Day, but we will set aside the sanctuary on Wednesday, January 3rd, because collectively as a church, we'll be seeking God and bringing our year before Him, and we'll provide some space and place throughout the entire day for you to come and um, inquire, and tune your ear to Him, and ask Him what He has for your year ahead. That'll culminate and us feasting together in the evening because we'll set aside Wednesday, January 3rd to fast. And in the evening, we'll have a potluck together um, and we'll feast and uh, worship to ring in our new year together. And then we'll be back here on Sunday, January 7th for regular uh, services. Everyone got it? All right. Um, as has been shared already, we are celebrating the coming of Jesus, God in the flesh, and God has invaded our reality and has done something in Christ that has changed everything. And we proclaim it to be, we know it to be uh, good news. And so we're spreading that, sharing that, um, testifying to what God's done in our lives. We typically focus on Christ's birth, uh, during this time, which is good and, and right, and not just his birth, but again, not just the event of his birth, but the implications uh, of his coming are something that we kind of seek to understand during this time. And after we read in scripture about the birth of Christ, the coming of Christ, after we read about the census, after we read about Bethlehem, after we read about there being no room in the inn, after we read about what the shepherds said and saw, after we read about the angels and we read about mangers and we read about Mary, we go on uh, to read in Luke 2 this, that after eight days, Jesus was circumcised. And this was the name given to him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice, according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves, two young pigeons. What, what's going on here? What's happening here? Well, Mary and Joseph are following Jewish law, or what's described as the law of the Lord, or the law of Moses, or the Torah, the instructions given in the law. And this is a purification ritual after birth. Let me read it to you from Leviticus 12. The Lord spoke to Moses. Moses, he's, he's an Old Testament guy, so we've just We've gone back a few thousand years now. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As at the time of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Then she shall continue for 33 days in the blood of her purifying. She shall not touch anything holy, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying are completed. But if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean for two weeks, as in her menstruation. And she shall continue in the blood of her purifying for 66 days. And when the days of her purifying are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a lamb, a year old for a burnt offering and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. And she shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. Then she shall be clean from the flow of her blood this is the law for her who bears a child, either male or female. And if she can't afford a lamb, 
Then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. I read this, um, I read this passage for a few reasons this morning. The first is that it's kind of helpful to know that Mary and Joseph uh, struggled financially. Like they essentially couldn't afford the first Christmas. Or at least they couldn't do, the, do it the way they wanted to do it. They wanted, I'm sure, to bring a lamb, but there's a concession in the law for people who can't afford a lamb. You can bring two pigeons, or as the 12 days of Christmas says, two turtle doves. So I think that it's really comforting as we look at the Christmas story to understand that God understands our reality. The second thing I want you to know as we read this and start here is that Jesus was born into a Leviticus loving family. They followed the law of the Lord, the law of Moses. They followed these customs. They took these serious and they didn't think, oh, because we had the son of God, then we've got a pass. We're exempt from these laws that have put in place by God. Jesus loved the book of Leviticus. Um, it was referenced in the video earlier. His message of loving thy neighbor is a borrowed one. His most famous maybe teaching is one that he takes from the book of Leviticus. He loved the book. He quotes it often. Lastly, what I want to say is we don't love the book of Leviticus. That was really weird what I just read. Let's be honest. Like some of you were like, I thought church was supposed to encourage my faith. <clears throat> I can't think of a book that's killed more Bible reading plans than Leviticus. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna get there in February and you're gonna be like, what the heck, man? Like some of it's strange and just bizarre, but then the parts of it that feel barbaric make us feel really uncomfortable. Why all the blood? There's so much talk of fluids in the book of Leviticus. A lot of talk about fluids. Why all the rituals? Why all the formalities? And, and what happens as you dig into Leviticus is like some really, some actually some much more disturbing questions come our way. Is God petty? Does he micromanage from on high? What's up with all the blood? Is God angry? Is God hard to please? Why all of these hoops to jump through? We love it when the Bible can be applied to our lives. I mean, even now you're like, how do I apply this? We love it when the Bible can be applied. And we make our way through Leviticus and go, I just can't see any way to apply this uh, to uh, my life. So we're in a short series during the holidays where we're taking a look at the first three books of the Bible. Christmas according to Genesis, Christmas according to Exodus, and Christmas according to Leviticus. And we're looking for the ways that the first three books help us understand the significance of Christ's coming. Jesus is the reason for the season. Some lady at Lowe's told me that. Jesus is the reason for the season. What, though, is the reason for Jesus? Like, why did he come? And as we look at the first three books, we gain a better understanding of the reason for Jesus. Again, I, I don't think that the second person of the Trinity needs a reason to exist, but we get a better sense of why he came as we look at these first three books. So David, he got Genesis because he doesn't work here. Matt, he got Exodus because he doesn't work here. And I got Leviticus because I get paid <clears throat> to do this. And I've spent a lot, I've spent too, too, too much time um, in the book of Leviticus, geeking out. And I am, I'm actually like very, very excited about um, what I've seen and the significance that's brought to Christ's coming through understanding the law of Moses. And I just want to warn you, I don't have enough time to geek out as hard as I want to or to get, get as excited as I uh, really am. So I'm hopefully 
going to get you leaning in to the book of Leviticus instead of leaning out. And then I'll record something tomorrow um, that kind of brings the second half of this. Otherwise, on a morning like this morning, I would end up getting excited and, and, and going long. That's when you guys scream, no, go long, but no one does it. No one's doing it. No one's saying that. Well, thanks, guys. <laughs> Merry Christmas to me. I found myself reflecting on the book of Leviticus and thinking, I don't think we actually have a problem with Leviticus necessarily. I think we actually have a problem with it, what it contains. And even if those things are found outside of the book of Leviticus, we struggle with those things. The first thing is detailed instructions, very detailed instructions. The world, as we know it, is made up of two groups of people, those who read the instructions and those who don't. And I would be of the, are there any pictures of that clan? Christmas Eve will look like my wife at some point saying, well, it says here. And I'll be like, what do you mean it says here? Like, show me what it says, you know, because I will not have read what it says. I resort to the manual. I resort to the instructions when the picture presented to me uh, doesn't cut it. And I'm guessing I'm not alone. Leviticus, what can help you is it is a user manual for priests. That's why it's so detailed. That's why it contains so much instruction. It's a priestly user manual. And just like you wouldn't sit down and read the user manual for that camera that Forrest is using back there. You'd probably just try to fire it up and use it. This is a thorough, detailed, um, I, I, yeah, like survey of how this could and should be used, okay? The name of the book comes from the tribe of Levi, which is a tribe of priests and it contains about, this book of the Bible in particular, can, contains about 251 laws, which you might be tempted to think like, hey, well, that's a lot. That's a lot of laws, 251. A lot of commands. I liked the love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. I'm good with that. 251 is a lot. This manual, you need to know, includes moral law, civil law, and ceremonial law. And when you know that, you think, oh, 251 is actually a small amount of laws. If you're going to instruct people's morality, this is how you should be a good guy. If you're going to instruct their national identity, this is how you should be a nation. And if you're going to instruct religious practice, like this is how you should worship me, I get it. It should probably be this long. And I offer this bit of feedback for those of you who read the Bible and struggle maybe with the instruction or what's up with all these rules, what's up with all these laws. I want to offer some perspective to you that may help you or cause you to lean into this book. I want you to know that these rules come in the context of relationship. These rules don't appear out of thin air. These rules are a part of a story. They're a part of a narrative. There is relationship that precedes these rules. So we just last week finished the book of Exodus, but you may know the book of Exodus starts with God coming down in a miraculous way and delivering his people from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. You've heard that story before, the 10 plagues that come and the people are ransomed, they're delivered, they're liberated by God in what is, I mean, quite a fireworks show. And now this swarm of slaves sets out on foot after 400 years of being bound and they have the task of becoming a people, becoming a nation. This swarm needs to become a community, a congregation. And this is what happens as they wander the wilderness 
And you know that they come to Mount Sinai, and on Mount Sinai, Moses is given 10 commandments. And he comes down with those commandments to say God has entered a covenant with us, only to find that the people of God have, right from the beginning, broken the covenant and worshipped something or someone other than the one true God, uh, Yahweh. So again, remember, this is the story. And this is important because these rules don't arrive without some understanding of the nature and character of Yahweh. And these people are sinning in the face of that knowledge, what's been revealed They don't just appear out of nowhere. Because I know some of you are bothered because you've been told your whole life, hey, why do we have to do that? And it's like, well, those are the rules. Well, I I have a question. Well, those are the rules. These rules do not appear without relationship and understanding of the nature and character of Yahweh. Exodus 19 says it this way. You yourselves, he's talking to the people who received the law. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You saw how... I rescued you from Egypt. You've experienced my loving kindness. You have reasons to trust me. Now obey my voice. I love in Deuteronomy uh, 6, Moses understands that a time is going to come when your kids are going to go, what the heck is up with all these rules? And look at what happens. When your son asks you in time to come, What's the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord God has commanded you? What's up with all these rules? Then you shall say to your son, those are the rules. No, you tell him the story. Tell him the story. We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. You should have been there. You should have seen it. And the Lord showed us signs, wonders, great and grievous. He's no one to be messed with. Against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household, it was before our own eyes. We saw it. And he brought us out from there that he might bring us in. He brought us out so that he could bring us into himself and give us the land that he swore to give our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good, for our good always that he might uh, preserve us alive as we are this day. He's trying to keep us with these rules. I love this. I was reading this thinking like, I'm going to do this as a parent. We're missing it if we're not telling the story. Well, we tithe. This is great. Well, we tithe. We give a tenth. No, tell them the story. Tell them the story about how you were bound by materialism and you were sinking in debt. And you discovered God's principles for your life and you began to give generously even when you didn't have it to give. And the Lord stepped in. Tell your kids that story. No sex before marriage. That's awesome. I'd I'd keep saying that. Before you say that, tell them the story. Tell them the story about the carnage in your own life and how you once operated using other people taking what they had to give. And then the love of Christ transformed you. And now you saw that you could actually love others in a way that doesn't take something from them, but gives to them. Tell them that story and then say, that's why we don't have sex before marriage. Tell the story. There's a lot of relationship that comes before these rules. The other reason for the rules that's really important to understand is obedience for what? Obedience for what? 
well, I want you to be my separate people from amongst the other cultures that surround you. I'm unique, God would say, I'm unique amongst the gods. I'm the one true God, and I want you too to be separate. So much of this is about modeling. I want you to be my representatives to the nations. I'm holy, therefore, be holy. Rep me well. He's not asking us to do something that he himself doesn't do and hasn't provided for us to do. Be merciful. Well, why? Because I'm merciful. Care for the poor because I care for the poor. Represent me to the nations of the earth. Do what I'm doing, not just do what I say. And lastly, I would say obedience for whose sake? Obedience for whose sake? You know, to appease some sort of fickle deity? No, he says, it's for your good. I'm trying to keep you alive, which is the classic dad talk. This is for your good, you know? And the kid's going like, how in the world? Could you, could all of my friends have a phone? Don't tell me this is for my good. That's the talk. And it appears over and over again throughout Scripture, and it's still going on in our lives. The second reason I think that we have struggle with the book of Leviticus is just blood and guts galore, like galore. There are parts of hunting that really attract to me, like middle of nowhere. That sounds really great to me right now, like just... Being lost sounds awesome. Not talking, but being with people, you know? That's what I make up. I've never been on a hunting trip, but that's what I make up. You're lost, and you're not even talking about it. You're just like, who cares? We might kill something today. So I actually even love camouflage, even though I don't like a gun or have a gun. I, I like all of it. I even like taxidermy. Here's where you lose me. Here's where you lose the making of that taxidermy. Guts. Like, I watch, yeah, I see some of the pictures you show me, like, this is what we're doing. We're like spilling its guts, you know, and I'm just like, geez, man, can't do it. The smell, there's a smell. I know it. I've never been, but I know that smell's sick. And you guys are just in it. You're just in it, and I'm out. And so there's so much blood in the book of Leviticus. There's so much bodily uh, fluid. And there are sacrifices, a sacrificial system that has been set up by God. And it's better actually to call these sacrifices offerings. Something is being offered to God. And the Hebrew word here is korban, which actually means to draw near. So as you offer something, you're drawing near. When you give, you're giving the draw near things. When you come before me, come with the draw near things. And so these offerings were uh, for the sake of a connection, not just appeasing some far off, you know, distant deity. This is a way of drawing near to him. And this offering was a, a, was a posture of surrender. So Leviticus 1 through 7 um, lays out five different offerings that are brought before God. Two of the offerings were ways to say thank you to God. And three of the offerings were ways to say, I'm sorry. And by the way, both of those would be needed in any one of your relationships. If you could get good at those two things, you're going to go a long way. If you don't just say sorry, but you say thank you. If you don't just say thank you, but you don't, you you get what I'm saying. You learn those two words, sorry and thank you. And it's probably going to be a good Christmas for you. So these are, I wish I had time to go into these because there's actually something to every one of these things. 
Offerings are burnt or consumed on the altar. Well, that's kind of weird that things are burnt up. But think about it. This was the ascension offering. This was meant for God. And how would something get to God? Well, it would be transformed into smoke and it would rise to him. And so this offering ascends to him. And that offering, by the way, is the entire bowl because God is worthy of it all. Now, the peace offering, the fellowship offering, that's different. That's actually, you get back some of what you offer with that one, and you feast on what was offered with your friends, as if to say, when you're good with him, it's going to go well with others. When you're at peace with God, you'll have peace with others. Anyways, this is not part of the talk. Well, i just excited about what these offerings I know, I get it, man, I get it, get it. So when the Israelites would come to God and say, sorry, sorry for what? Sorry for adding to the evil in the world that God is trying to eradicate. Sorry for bringing it into his presence. They would offer an animal whose life would serve as a substitute or an offering for wrongs done. What's crazier than all the blood in the book of Leviticus is what the blood does and what it means. For me, if something gets blood on it, it's contaminated. In the book of Leviticus, if it gets blood, it's been cleansed. Well, that's kind of strange, right? So things are being, I mean, blood's everywhere. But in the sprinkling, smothering, covering, splattering of blood, things are being purified or made clean, not contaminated. Blood for us is a symbol of probably murder, a crime scene. I don't know what we think of when we see blood. But they would have thought about life. Leviticus 17, 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So we're supposed to see the blood and not necessarily think death, but to think this is life. This is the life of God being covered over that. The life of God being smothered, smeared, splattered, sprinkled. It's, 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 it's everywhere, but it represents life. And this is foreign to us. As I thought about this sacrificial system, I thought this is brilliant for a number of reasons. One, the people of God, it would have been impossible for them to escape the seriousness of sin. And it's easy for us to deceive ourselves and to think our sin is no big deal and there's no cost to the way that we're carrying on. But when you brought a sacrifice to the altar and that thing bled and died for sin or failure or regret in your own life, it would have been impossible for you to go like, no big deal, it's not, it's anything but a big deal. Nancy Guthrie says this, imagine the sensory overload of this experience, the violent resistance of the animal, the spurting of blood, the sound of pulling the animal apart the smell of its burning flesh and bones. Imagine the emotional and spiritual impact of offering this sacrifice, knowing that it was your sin that made this death necessary. And imagine the frustration in knowing that you'll be back tomorrow or the next week because you're going to sin again. I think another thing that would have been brilliant about this system is that it would have been been obvious to those offering sacrifices that God is just. He doesn't leave sin unpunished as a just God. And it also would have been obvious through the sacrificial system that God is merciful because a substitute is offered in our place. So it would have been with this really strange mix 
of both truth and grace. And it brought, what's, what does it say it brought in the text? Atonement. That word literally means at one meant. At one meant again. And I think if I'm going to have at one meant with anyone after there's been a break in relationship or sin that separates and divides, you're going to need two things. One, you're going to need to recognize the seriousness of what you've done. Good luck going forward with someone. This is why some of our relationships remain, you know, we're together, we'll see them, we'll be in the same house, but we're not at one. We're not at one because the seriousness of what happened has not been seen or understood. And the second thing is a sacrifice has not been offered. Someone's not come with something costly, humbled themselves, and offered a sacrifice. I'm sorry. It's serious what happened. And I humble myself, and I'm sorry for it. It creates at one in our relationships with both God and man. What do we got here? So, um, there's, it's full of priestly rituals. So, it's not just like how we approach God through these offerings, but there's detailed instructions for who approaches God and when they approach God. It's not like, hey, I've got my offering ready. You can go in at any time. There's actually times, rhythms, rituals set up for the priests. Again, incredible significance to all of this stuff. I was reading one. It was so weird. One of the ways that the priests, these would be the mediators between God and man. The priests took their job seriously because they represented God to man and they represented men to God. And so they were right there in the middle, taking it really seriously. One of the ways that they would be prepared was again, blood, a little dab, a little dab on the right earlobe, a little dab on the right thumb, a little dab on the big toe. And I just remember, I was reading it. I was like, this is weird, man. This is weird. I can't believe I believe this stuff. Then it dawns on me, what's the blood? Well, the blood's the life. It consecrates. It sets things apart. So what's happening there? Oh, we want priests who hear only the commands of God, who do only the commands of God, and who walk in the ways of God. And you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. I wouldn't do it with the blood, but maybe like an oil, like we would use an oil. You get, we're not getting blood involved. When it comes to rituals, we also understand that they're often enjoyed and rarely understood. Why do we celebrate Christmas on December 25th? There's a few of you who might know. The rest of you are just like, I don't know, I get it off of work. Why? Jesus wasn't born on December 25th, not even in the month of December. So why? Why are red and green the colors of Christmas? Why do we kiss under mistletoe? Why do we put wreaths on our doors? Why do we leave cookies and milk out for Santa? I read that this started during the Great Depression because it was a sign of gratitude during a really difficult time, a way of saying thanks during a time when things were sparse. What about poinsettias? How'd they get in the game? Ugly sweater parties, we have our friends from the north to thank for that. That's from Canada in the 80s. What's up with the Yule log? Eggnog, fruitcake. When your kids ask you this, when they say, why do we eat fruitcake? Tell them the story. We were slaves in Egypt and this bread is that old. Like, tell them, this is the manna. The, the, tell them the story of, of fruitcake because we don't eat it because it's good. If it's good, it's because we put a ton of butter on it to choke it down. Anything you have to put a ton of butter on to choke it down is not good. Lastly, I think we struggle with this book 
not just because of the formalities, but because of this idea of holiness. We struggle with holiness. It's something that God is, and it's something we simply don't want. Holiness, that word is used 87 times in the book of Leviticus. It's the overarching theme of the book. It's holy priests in holy clothes and a holy land, um, a, a holy place using holy utensils, celebrating holy days. That's a holiday, by the way. Living by a holy law so that they can be a whole kingdom of priests and become a holy nation. This is the overarching themes. And so God gives these laws in order to separate them from the culture around them but they're separated for the purpose of something. And this is really important. Please get this. Please, next time in February, when you get stuck in Leviticus, please remember this. That yes, holiness means purity. It means to be unique, to be separate. It does. But it is to be unique and to be separate for a purpose. And that is devotion to Yahweh. Be set apart and be devoted to Yahweh. And that's a different idea of holiness. Because when we think of holiness, it's like abstain. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't chew. Don't smoke. Don't hang out with people who do or whatever. You know, like don't, don't. And yes, that's a part of it. But it's so that something could be used exclusively in devotion to Yahweh. You're my people. So we get this. My toothbrush has a dedicated use. What happens when I dedicate it to another use? Well, I'm done with that toothbrush or you boil it, right? Because it has a dedicated use. Or I watch my kids. Tiffany has these killer, this killer set of like kitchen scissors that she protects. They're like expensive. Those are not just every... You know, and I watch her, she like cuts chicken with them. Then I watch my kids grab them and cut the top off a of Go-Gurt, you know? And you're thinking like, that has a dedicated use of like raw poultry and I wouldn't use it, but I do to cut my guitar strings. And she's like, don't, don't do this with these shears. They're expensive, right? So we get this. This is what's happening over and over again. This has a dedicated use. And if you use it to do something else, you better boil that thing before you bring it back into my presence. And if that's the case for your mouth, then certainly it's the case as you come before God. You've got to deal with what you're bringing into his presence, and that's what the system is designed to do. This is it. There's a huge dilemma at play in this story. The story is this. The presence of God has come and filled the tabernacle. The end of Exodus, the tabernacle of God has been erected. The presence of God fills the tabernacle. And then God speaks to Moses from inside the tabernacle. How? How will the place of God's dwelling, his tabernacle, become also the place of meeting, the tent of meeting? How will we have communion with him? What will we do with the holiness he demands? He is holy, and we don't want anything to do with it. How will we go forward with him and be his people? The holiness of God, it turns out to be really dangerous. I think it helps to think of the sun in an attempt to understand the holiness of God. The sun is good. The sun is unique. The sun is very powerful. It's intense. The sun is an incredible source of life. It is also something that you need to be protected from. You can't handle it in unfiltered form. You need an atmosphere because the sun is also dangerous. Does that mean it's bad? No, it's incredibly good. It's just nothing to be messed with. So you better hydrate. You better put on sunscreen or the newfangled sun shirt. 
you better do something because you can't handle just how intense and powerful the sun is. That is the book of Leviticus, an atmosphere so that we can handle all of the benefits of the sun without being destroyed in its presence. Leviticus is a big thing of sunscreen. That's what I think. God called to Moses, spoke to him from inside the tent. That's how Leviticus starts. The next scroll, Numbers, starts and Moses is inside the tent. What happened? Leviticus. It worked. Leviticus worked. The sun guard meant that he could be in the sun all day without being scorched. Leviticus, it works. And it answers the big question, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? What will happen on the podcast is I'll talk about all the amazing ways that Jesus fulfills this sacrificial system, how he dealt with the law and the rules and how he is the offering that ascends to God and ends the sacrificial system. But I want to say this as we close and get ready to celebrate. Leviticus starts with Moses outside and it ends with Moses inside because Leviticus worked. The Bible opens with God dwelling with his people. Paradise, Eden, everything we know and want, all is calm, all is bright. But humanity, just a short time, chooses life apart from God. They rebel, they're banished from his presence. Evil is introduced and it's all downhill from there. But the Bible ends, the Bible starts in God's presence. Presence is forfeited and lost, we're banished from it. This is how Revelation 21 says the story ends. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more loss of life or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. What happened? How did we get from outside his presence to God's dwelling? being with his people. Jesus, he worked. He brokered the deal, brought heaven to earth, ransomed a people by his blood from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And now they offer him praise. Come on. He's made a way where there was no way. The deal could not get done. There's nothing we could do to get to him. Heaven steps down and invades earth in the person and work of Jesus. And we experience the beginning of that. Let earth receive her king. Would you stand with me? Thank you, Father, for the incredible provision in your son. And thank you for this elaborate system that points us to your son. Would you help our attitudes about Leviticus and just the Old Testament in general? Would we read it the way Jesus read it? And I just want to ask for your provision right now for families who are broken and uh, hurting, struggling, striving, trying to put on a face. I ask that you would provide for them miraculously right now. I pray that your blood would provide for sickness and disease right now. I ask for everyone here who's sick that the blood of Christ would be applied to our lives, our bodies, that healing would come to your people. 
And I thank you. We thank you, God, for healing this great divide. There was no way. There was no way. In fact, these animals, they just covered. You cleansed. You cleansed us. Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Help us to wait ready, to long for the day, and to bring heaven to earth. Thank you for being with your people, taking up residence with us and in us. In Jesus' name, amen.